will be on the record. This is the time and place for the pre-hearing conference in applications 11-03-014, and 11-07-020. And this pre-hearing conference is going to be ad addressing um, the issues to be considered uh, pursuant to decisions 12-02-014, 1204018 and 1204019. And good morning, everyone. Um, I am ALJ Yuki Kugawa, and um, the Science Commissioner is President Heavey, and he is represented today by his Chief of Staff, uh, Carol Brown. Welcome. Thank you. And um, <coughs> a couple housekeeping things before we begin. First, we, we do have a number of individuals who are listening in on the phone, so I am going to ask everyone to please um, speak into the microphone. Uh, if you are not seated, their microphone, and you wish to speak, um, please come up and borrow one of the microphones uh, if you wish to speak. Okay, second, uh, we do have a gentleman here who is videotaping. Uh, this videotape is not for the purposes of well, creating what is considered our official record. The official record for this proceeding is being recorded by our court reporters and the transcripts represent the official record for this proceeding. Okay, anything before we proceed? Do you okay. need to check the microphone? No, off the record, sorry. We're, we're fine, I think. Um, and we're all the microphones working? Our technician is here, okay. Uh, so can, can you tap it or are we stop? Okay, back on the record. Okay, the agenda for today is first to take appearances and then we'll be discussing um, the scope and the schedule for the proceeding. Okay, concerning uh, appearances, Anybody who uh, is planning to participate in this proceeding as a party should have submitted one of these yellow forms. We are creating a new service list uh, for the consolidated proceedings and it is called phase two. So even if you had previously been uh, and listed as a party or as information only or on state service uh, for any one of the three proceedings, you do need to fill out a form and you know, again become either party information only or uh, state service as appropriate. Okay, and what I'd like to do, uh, because there are a number of people who have not appeared before the commission before uh, or participated in the proceeding, I would like to kind of go over some of the ground rules of you know, what is party status and what does it mean to be a party. Um, as a general matter, you know, anybody can participate in the commission proceeding and you can do so as a member of the general public by coming to a commission meeting, uh, speaking during the co public comment period, sending letters to the commissioners or even directly to myself, or um, coming to public participation hearings and speaking in public participation hearings. However, if you become a party in this proceeding, your job will be to help me develop the record so that President Peavy and I can uh, come up with the appropriate resolution for the issues presented before us. As an active party, you are expected to participate by serving testimony, cross-examining witnesses, filing of briefs, um, and also participating <coughs> in workshops. Yeah, you will not, as a party, be able to present, you know, come forward in um, at the public comment uh, session during commission meetings, uh, you're, that's for non-parties to speak. You also will not be allowed to speak during um, public participation hearings. <coughs> any communications with myself or any other decision maker, you know, which would include you know, the commissioners, their advisors, um, will be reportable. It is an ex-party contact. Uh, anything so, you know, that can, is a substantive nature. So I just want to make sure that for those of you who are becoming parties for the first time, you know that there are a number of responsibilities that you will have. I am also going to be expecting all of you as parties to be familiar with the Commission's rules, practice, and procedure, and also 
to comply with our electronic filing requirements. The Public Advisor's Office is available to assist with you know, whatever questions you may have on any of this. However, if you are going to practice before the Commission, you do have these responsibilities. Okay? So I do want to make sure that's very clear from the you know, beginning. Also, if it turns out that you are not actively participating, I will move you from party status to information only. We are doing electronic service, so if you are information only, you will receive everything because you, know, you will be on the service list, but you will not be considered a party. Uh, you can read whatever you want you know, that gets served. You, um, as information, only may speak at the, um, during the, at the public participation hearings or during the public comment period at the commission meetings. Okay, are there any questions before we go? Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is I would like to take appearances for the record and um, only those who are seeking party status is, is what I need. I don't need if you're planning to be information only to you know, introduce yourself or anything. Uh, so why don't we start, um, I guess Mr. Heidel, are you speaking or are you just videotaping? Uh, I'm also a party. I'm with uh, Ecological okay. Options. Network. Could you please speak into the microphone then? Um, my name is Jim Heddle. I'm with the Ecological Options Network, uh, EON. We've been parties in the first uh, part of the proceeding and we'll be in this. Okay, thank you. Mr. Warner. Uh, Christopher Warner. Um, I will be representing Pacific Gas and Electric Company in the proceeding. Sandy Maurer, EMF Safety Network. I'm James Weil. I will represent Aglet Consumer Alliance as an active party. My name is Jim Tobin. And I'm representing the County of Marin, the Town of Fairfax, uh, a number of other local governments, and the Alliance for Human and Environmental Health. Mary Beth Brangan, Ecological Options Network. Um, good morning, my name is Martin Hovack. I'm representing the Center for Electrosomotic Prevention. <laughs> William Booth, uh, representing CLECA, California Large Energy Consumers Association. Good morning, Your Honor. David Wilner, representing Wilner and Associates. I do have a very brief comment. Do you want that now or a little later? Are you commenting concerning the scope? The Just a general comment for the hearing this morning. All right. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. We are thankful that the Commission has approved a smart meter opt-out option for utility customers in California. However, it's very important to note that the Commission has the duty to determine whether smart meters are actually safe. Mr. Woman, I think you're going into what you would want to have the scope of this proceeding to be. I'd like to hold that off until we discuss the scope. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Sharon Yang on behalf of Southern California Edison. <coughs> Steve Morthino representing Alameda County residents concerned about smart meters. And I want to mention that I, uh, that we, also have an open and active application before the uh, Public Utilities Commission 1107009, uh, which uh, questions and calls in question the uh, original authorization of the entire smart meter program, which, if found to be valid, would make this entire proceeding illegitimate. Charlie Snyder, San Diego Gas and Electric. Alan Trial, attorney for SDPD. Stephen Patrick, representing SoCal Gas. We've been here to party here. Okay, and Mr. Patrick, you've just filed, uh, I should say, SoCal Gas has just filed an application <coughs> also for <coughs> opt out, correct? Yes, Sean, that was on Friday. Okay, 
Yes, Your Honor, we did. It was on Friday, and it's been accepted by the Commission's Doctor Office. Marcel Haberger with the Utility Reform Network. Uh, one more. Sheree mm -hmm. Chan with the Division of Ratepayer Advocates. Is there anyone else who is seeking party status at this point? David Browner, Village Properties. Jeremy Johnson, and I'm representing multi-unit building residents here in San Francisco. Okay. okay, and I do remind all of you of your responsibilities as parties. Um, I also received a number of uh, appearance forms that I am going to read into the record at this point um, and they will be entered in as parties as well. Uh, Alexander Binnick of DE Toxics Institute, Barbara Schneer of Southern Californians for Wired Solutions to Smart Meters, David Hubert who I believe is representing himself, okay. Melissa Levine of Stop Smart Meters Irvine. Elizabeth Barris of the People's Initiative Foundation. Toby Cecil of Marina Meadows Apartments. And Supervisor Efren Carrillo, uh, who is representing the 5th District of the County of Sonoma. Okay, I also um, just received by email a, uh, a form, an appearance form by Edward Hasbrook, and he will also be added. <coughs> Consistent with our rules of practice and procedure, rules 1.9 and 1.10, um, any filer who serves the um, service list, will it will be the entire service list. That way, everyone who is information only and state service will have everything, including <coughs> the service of testimony. Anything else? Yes, Ms. Mauer. Uh, will the service list for the consolidated, consolidated proceeding, the new service list, be posted on, for example, if I go to the PG&E proceeding that I've been involved in, will that consolidated service list be posted on that proceeding, or will there be a full uh, new proceeding number? No, How does that work? What we'll be doing is, with the consolidation of the proceedings, uh, the Lead proceeding will be application 11.03.014. So if you go to, the, that is the proceeding that you will be looking for, all of the consolidated um, filings and also the um, service list will be there. And it will be created this afternoon, I, um, hopefully this afternoon. There is no service list at this point uh, for what I'm calling phase two. And this, that is how you will find the service list. It'll have service list and there should be a service list that says phase two. Thank you. And that's what you'll be using. Okay, anything else? Okay, turning to the scope now. Okay, the, the scope of this proceeding, you know, uh, as directed by the decisions, uh, were, are to consider cost and cost allocation issues associated with offering an opt-out option for each of the utilities. Also, we're going to be considering whether to allow a, a community opt-out option. The pre-hearing conference statements that I received, I'm going to just read you know, who I've received them from, and if I've missed any, yeah, I would like to know that as well. I received pre-hearing conference statements from the Center for Electrosmog Prevention, the County of Lake, EMF Safety Network, jointly by PG&E and SDG&E, uh, Southern California Edison on its own, uh, Southern California's for Wired so Solutions to Smart Meters, the Utility Consumers Action Network, and Wilner and Associates. Did anyone else file a PHC statement that I didn't receive or I didn't read you? Okay. The PHC statements that I received uh, some of them addressed just the cost and cost allocation issues and the community opt-out option. Others proposed that the proceeding be expanded. And um, why don't we, and I don't want to hear a repetition of what's been 
put into your PHC statements. I've already read them and I will be considering them, but um, why don't we just discuss real briefly, you know, why to expand the scope and what are some of the issues to consider. And Mr. Wilner, you had started speaking. I cut you off. I will let you start first. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll start again so I don't lose track of what I said. Once again, we are thankful that the Commission has approved a smart meter opt-out option for utility <coughs> customers in California. However, there is an important, however, it is important to note that whether smart meters are actually safe, I'm, I'm correction. However, it's important to note that the Commission does have a duty to determine whether smart meters are actually safe. And we do not believe that under any circumstances, customers should be required to pay any cost for opting out of the smart meter program. The second phase of this proceeding should focus on that very important issue. There is no question that some people become ill when a smart meter is installed on their home and as a result of the opt-out opportunity, it, we also <laughs> learned that removal of the smart meter does bring relief to them in their homes, but they are still surrounded by smart meters in their neighborhood that negatively affect their health. Some customers with health issues have been able to get their neighbors to replace their smart meters to help out, and this has brought about a very startling revelation. Many of those people thought that they were doing a favor for their neighbor with the problem, but the symptoms that they did not attribute to their own smart meter have also dissipated. This includes ringing in the ears, sleep problems, anxiety, and headaches. I will submit correspondence during the proceeding to confirm these statements. We believe that the cost and monthly fees imposed impose an unreasonable hardship on customers that must pay those costs for their neighbors opting out, which in some cases could be as much as $2,000 during the first year. In addition, our view is that the fees no doubt discourage others from exercising their right to get rid of their smart meters. The Commission has a duty to protect all the utility customers with respect to health and safety issues, and the question of whether smart meters are safe must be determined now while this proceeding is open. As things stand, many customers do not know if they should opt out, and they are looking to the Commission for, a reli for reliable information rather than being told that they must opt out if they're uncertain. We also believe there must be hearings rather than a workshop in this proceeding, or possibly both, so parties can present their evidence and cross-examine evidence provided by others. We have filed a pre-hearing conference statement with additional details, and we urge the Commission to consider all the points we have raised. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment? Mr. Coleman. Um, this is Martin Homek representing the Center for Electricity Prevention. Um, we had, we are currently concerned with the opt-out as it is occurring. Um, we tried to file a motion to ask the commission to oversee the opt-out because it appears to be self-regulated that the uh, utility companies are um, filing advice letters and. Um, implementing the opt-out, and we have lots of members, uh, concerned people in the San Diego area who are saying that they are not aware of the uh, choices, they are not aware of an opt-out being available, and they're not aware of why there's an opt-out. We would like to have the commission somehow communicate all this to the ratepayers who are not in this proceeding, which is many of them, well, most of them. So, Center for Electrosmog Prevention requests that uh, a commission agency such as Division of Ratepayer Advocate over Advocates oversee the opt-out. Um, if they choose not to, that perhaps a panel be uh, con constructed of consenting protesting parties who would oversee the uh, implementation and their 
use their um, respective utilities service area. Um, our other concern is that um, the Public Utilities Commission doesn't uh, consider the health and safety aspects of the uh, smart meter wireless emissions because we are told from another <laughs> proceeding, I think it was A11, um, anyway, there's a decision on it saying that health issues won't be considered, and so we would like a review of the state and federal laws that are the reason, the rationale for the Public Utilities Commission not to consider the health issues, because we believe the state and federal laws do give the Public Utilities Commission the authority to oversee this. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, before, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Holman, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, as, as you discuss the expanding the scope of this proceeding, um, this proceeding really is, it's about opt-out, an opt-out option. Um, the issues concerning health, the con issues concerning review of you know, uh, deployment, uh, why should we be expanding it in this proceeding, and why should it not be the subject of a separate proceeding? Uh, because people are suffering right now, as Mr. Wilmer mentioned. There are people who have anxiety attacks, who are um, feeling um, nauseous or some other ill effects which they attribute to smart meters. And if they are wrong, then perhaps there's something else. But if, we, if there's a health impact, uh, the commission should, just through its public just for the public good, investigate it so that people can be at rest as to what they believe is affecting them so they can be treated if they have some other illness. Or if the smart meter is causing the illness, that we will know it immediately instead of delaying this. And this has been going on since 2006. Californians for uh, renewable energy requested in the original uh, smart meter proceeding that there be a CEQA analysis, and that was denied. And they requested there be a public health analysis in 2006. And so it's been six years and nothing has happened. Nobody has evaluated the uh, wireless emissions health impacts. <coughs> if you um, look at the United States research, um, no one has ever done a study, even though it's a very simple method to do it. You could find an electrosensitive group of people identified by uh, medical doctors and put them in a room in a Faraday cage with a and have a double-blind study, and you could find out whether people are um, actually feeling um, ill effects or not. Um, my own personal experience is that people with uh, migraines do feel ill effects. They feel nauseous. They feel sick with flashing lights. And a flashing visible light to us is just another frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. A uh, smart meter is a different one again. Um, a cell phone is another. Okay, and, and why would you want to just look at one specific um, item, such as a smart meter from the electric utilities, wouldn't this be something that's more appropriate to be considered also with the uh, communications utilities? Uh, water utilities are also implementing these. You know, you're trying to look at something that should be probably considered on a much broader basis uh, in a very narrow proceeding, and that is where my concern is. Um, is why expand here when it looks like it would impact a much greater area? And, and I think that's, that's the question I have. Um, anecdotal, uh, you know, the anecdotes of what's, what's occurring, you know, I, I can't say that, you know, they're not occurring. I can't say that they are occurring, but, you know, is it the smart meter? Is it, as you said, cell phones? Or you know, what is the cause? And that is where my concern is: is that we are trying to shoehorn an issue into this proceeding, and I, I don't think it's appropriate to do that. But I am willing to consider it. But I'd like to hear from parties on this. Well, okay, Ms. Mauer. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just want to say, in addition, I have a lot to say, but uh, there have been studies, and these studies have shown that people do have EHS, and there are that that's very valid. Um, so I don't think we need more studies at this point. We have studies. We need an opportunity to be heard on the studies that are already there. And uh, I, I, we, we did include the, the request for uh, health studies. I'm uh, not sorry, health, uh, a health 
hearings on health impacts from smart meters. And we're also asking for uh, hearings on impa safety impacts, including the impacts of smart meters that have caused burned out appliances, that have exploded and have caused fires, because this is an issue that the utilities have denied, and this commission has never taken it up. The EMF Safety Network had a filing. It was dismissed in December of 2010. We are, we are waiting for our rehearing request to be um, acted upon. And so I think that considering the amount of people that are suffering from the smart meters, the amount of backlash this commission is seeing, that it would be prudent to, to take the time now to, to, to open this discussion. I don't think it's necessary to wait and include uh, all the cell towers, et cetera. I mean, the commission had previously ordered uh, more workshops as more information on RF science became available, and that was in 1995, and the commission has never done that. <coughs> We've never undertaken a study on health impacts of wireless. The World Health Organization has taken a stand on this now. You probably already know this, but I want to get to my main points. The basic uh, reason, there has been no stated reason that this opt-out proceeding was initiated. The only reason stated is that any customer for any reason can opt out. If they didn't want one, they didn't have to have one, but there was never a stated reason. So, Network believes that the stated reason is actually that this is a customer rights issue, that a customer should have the right, correct? So I'm asking for an expansion on that issue of customer rights. and. Uh, a lot of that is stated in my statement. Um, I think also that we, we are suggesting that there is no evaluation on cost except to say that the shareholders should cover the cost. That there should be no fee to individual customers. I believe that it's absolutely impossible, will be absolutely impossible to determine a cost because the cost is dependent on how many opt out considering the commission has stated that anyone for any reason can opt out, it's an unlimited pool of who can opt out. So to come up with a number would be very, very challenging to do that, because you will never know how many will opt out. Um, there are many unresolved problems with smart meters, and I believe that the one-size-fits-all solution of an opt-out for a fee will not resolve the customer problems. And there was a hearing recently in Maine. There was an appeal uh, in front of the Maine Judicial Court, and I transcribed what the one commissioner said, and the, the uh, actually not a commissioner, but the justice. She was talking about how the main public utilities commission never d made a determination on whether or not smart meters were safe. So basically, leaving the public up to making their own decision. And her comment was this: the commission, in fact, declined to do the analysis analysis the last time around. Is an opt-out provision an appropriate substitute for having the Commission exercise its statutorily presented responsibilities and authority to make the decisions about health and safety? And I want to give that to you because I think it's a really important question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martino. Thank you. Uh, prior to my statement about how I think this um, proceeding should be, uh, the, the scope should be expanded, uh, let me simply mention that uh, the uh, application that uh, I mentioned earlier does call for hearings uh, on the health issue throughout California as provided by law. Now, the way I would suggest that this, that the scope of this hearing be expanded is that it should be brought into accord with the law. Now, uh, what I mean by that is that there is no legislative mandate for installation of smart meters. All there is is a mandate by the Public Utilities Commission to public utilities to make it available. Now, the Public Utilities Commission does not have legislative power, so it does not have the power to direct the citizens of California to accept the smart meter. This has been recognized in part by the fact that the Public Utilities Commission uh, uh, provided for an opt-out, 
But the opt-out does assume that there is a legal mandate where there is none. So I think that this proceeding should be expanded away from an opt-out option to an opt-in option as being the fundamental way in which California should approach the smart meters. And if that happened, if the opt-out was transformed into an opt-in, then the process of costs for the process would then be shifted to those who want smart meters. That would be very easy for the utilities to calculate. And those who simply don't want them would be free from any uh, additional costs. So I would propose that, that that be the, the transformation and the expansion of the scope of this hearings uh, here. Thank you. Uh, I'm concerned that um, this is Mary Beth Brangan from Eon uh, about the uh, and the reason of uh, that I'm concerned is the wireless mesh network in addition to the individual meter. So this is why it's so necessary for us to expand the scope here because it's not uh, an issue of uh, a single home. And uh, the, the ramifications, the implications of this technology and this planned um, system infrastructure all have impacts. So if you, as an individual, opt out, you're still becoming, you're still impacted by the um, infrastructure next to your house, by all your neighbors, by the um, infiltration into the wiring that this uh, pulsed radiation uh, emits, it's it's uh, a total a total picture that we have to look at, and that's why it's so necessary for us to expand uh, the hearing to include why people are suffering. Thank you, Mr. Wild. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm James Weil for Aglet. Uh, Aglet will not participate in the issue of exercise by local governments and entities, but Aglet has no objection to including that issue in the scope. Concerning scope, I hope the Commission will realize that cost and cost allocation issues will require an analysis of participation rates. Uh, uh, Mr. Shames, on behalf of UCAN, has proposed that the proceeding be delayed until 2013 in order to assess or have more updated data on participation rates. I'm not sure I agree with him, but I do want to make sure that the issue of participation rates stays in the proceeding. Uh, second, I would like the Commission uh, to take up the issue that Mr. Homick raised in one of his pleadings about discrimination. The uh, there is, uh, there seems to me to be a live issue of whether or not charging customers for opt-out is legal considering that opt-out decisions can be driven for medical reasons. Um, I'm not a lawyer, it's hard for me to vet all of that, but I do see a very clear connection between medical conditions and the possibility of discrimination uh, when it's pretty clear to me at least that the customers who are choosing to opt out to opt out are doing so based on medical grounds. And the commission seems to be hiding its head in the sand about some of that stuff, but I do hope that the commission would entertain the issue of discrimination associated with medical conditions. Um, <coughs> finally, uh, there seems to be a consensus that the scope of this phase of the proceeding includes cost and cost allocation. I've been doing cost effectiveness studies on behalf of the Commission and before the Commission since the late 1970s. And one of the very first principles in assessment of costs is the inclusion of what are called participant costs. In other words, customer decisions and public policy are not driven only by costs incurred by the utilities, but they are, should include the notion of societal costs and costs to the participants. And 
when I think about participant costs and whether or not the Commission should be uh, allocating costs to only participants or to the ratepayers as a whole, I keep coming back to the notion that participant costs include pain. They include the medical costs that they might incur. They include personal discomfort. Um, for those reasons, I think the Commission should keep its eyes and ears open to the possibility of considering health impacts uh, as part of the universe of customer costs. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor, for your question about why we should expand the scope of the second phase. To me, the most startling reason is the fact that we have filed a complaint with the Commission, case number 11-10-028. And we actually did that in response to your question and others about the health and safety issues. As a matter of fact, Commissioner Simon, in his concurring opinion authorizing the opt-out program in California, suggested that we file a separate action within the Commission's jurisdiction and according to the Commission's rules to target these very issues that you're asking about. Unfortunately for us and for the people of California, the Commission now has decided to dismiss our complaint. Most troublesome, if you check the record, is the logic behind dismissing our complaint is we have an opt-out program. So people can opt out of the smart meter and we don't have to worry whether they get sick or whether they have safety issues at home. That really does defy logic to me. There's two things to consider here. First, people don't have a choice when it's time to get electricity for their home for their business. They can't go out to the ABC company and have a deal with a competitor. This uh, pg and &E, the utilities in this proceeding have a monopoly. They have a lock hold on this business. And, and I'm saying that in response to your concern about other issues, other wireless device issues that may somehow coalesce with the complaints on the smart meters. The smart meters are attached to our <coughs> homes. They're attached to the wiring in our homes and they are a permanent fixture. And clearly they are harmful to some people. Cell phones, computers, and other devices are optional. If you're concerned about your cell phone being dangerous, get rid of it. <coughs> if you're concerned about your computer or something else that's in question, again, you can dispose of it. But you can't dispose of your electricity, you can't dispose of your electric meter. I'm very troubled that the Commission would consider throwing out our complaint uh, on the grounds that it's moot. It, yes? Concerning your complaint, that is, that is really outside of the scope of this proceeding. Um, I don't know where you are on that, if that is something that, if it's a proposed decision that's been issued, or if you're at a point where you can actually appeal the proposed decision, and, and that is where you should be making your arguments, not here. Well, I didn't mean to drag the complaint and to argue that case, only to illustrate that this is like the Kafka court. Today you're telling us this is outside of the scope of this proceeding, there should be another proceeding to deal with these issues. And with all due respect, there is one. But the commission is throwing it out. So I wasn't arguing the merits of our case, only responding to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, you will need to come up here. Uh, Your Honor, um, I guess I just want to respond to your question about uh, whether the scope of this should relate to health effects. Uh, that wasn't my question. My question was, should it be expanded beyond just cost and cost allocation issues? Mm -hmm. Well, then I guess my response is yes. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Um, well, yes, I, I, just, I just want to say that that's why many of us are here. And the health issue is probably the most important thing. And going forward, I think it will be the most important thing. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
anyone else concerning the scope? Okay, and if anyone else in the audience who is a party who wishes to speak concerning scope, um, you'd like to come up so that we are closer to the microphone. My name's David Browner. My wife and I own several multifamily dwellings in Marin County where all the electrical and gas meters are in every case located on one wall of the building near living spaces. In one case there are nine electrical meters attached to one wall. Um, many of us may remember when it was possible to go into a restaurant and be greeted by a host or hostess who asked smoking or non-smoking. If you chose non-smoking, the result was often not good because you were exposed to secondhand smoke anyway. There were smokers close by and the effect of the non-smoking section was basically negated. Similarly, if one person in an apartment complex chooses a, a smart meter, when the majority choose analog, everyone is exposed to the mesh network of pulsed radiation. Uh, just as we were exposed to secondhand smoke in a non-smoking section. Therefore, we're asking that multifamily dwellings be classified as communities and accorded the right to choose to be smart meter free. We would like our buildings to provide living accommodations that are safe and free of the mesh network of pulsed radiation admitted by smart meters. I, I feel like it's a disclosure issue in a way, just like uh, lead-free uh, paint disclosures and, uh, and mold disclosures. I feel I need to uh, inform my tenants that this, uh, this is something that is hazardous to their health. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, what I would like to just raise one issue concerning the scope and um, actually it was raised with respect to the uh, community issue is looking at community opt-out. Um, Mr. Tobin, you know, I know you are representing for the community opt-out local governments. Um, however, you know, my perspective is, is that um, apartment buildings, condo, condominium complexes should be included <coughs> in, a, in a community, in the term and definition of community for purposes of the opt-out. Um, do you have any further comments on, on that issue? We would fully support that, and I don't think it's inconsistent with what uh, local governments are seeking. I think they are viewing themselves as a relatively obvious community, uh, mm -hmm. but they're responding to input from their own citizens who they feel they have an obligation to serve, uh, many of whom live in multi-dwelling unit situations. Uh, a lot of the issues are interrelated here, and I didn't want to get into whether the scope should be expanded or not, but undoubtedly when you hear local government officials testify here, they will tell you that one of the things they're responding to is health concerns of their citizens. It doesn't mean you have to decide whether their perception of how they rule on those is right or wrong given the science, but you can't exclude that as a rational basis for them wanting to uh, propose a community opt-out plan based on this technology. Uh, I, I think also one of the concerns uh, that we hope we can uh, present testimony about is uh, what are the, if you will, criteria that a community should meet in order to be able to exercise this right. And the local governments understand how they make decisions uh, in their, as the commission makes decisions, uh, there are a lot of questions about the very many differing forms of uh, <coughs> excuse my voice, uh, forms of communities. Uh, we have a small senior citizens community in my town in, in Marin County. I think it's 15 over 55 uh, people live there and three of them got a smart meter. The others don't know what to do. They don't know if they're a condominium or a, uh, you know, what their legal structure is. So I think we should be very open about this question, but uh, people should be free to propose a reasonable definition that could be feasibly implemented as a community. Thank you. 
any other comments at this point? Otherwise, I think I would like to kind of move over into the schedule, and I think that that may address some of the issues of how we how we uh, attack you know, the two big issues identified, and if there are other issues that is ultimately determined to be in within the scope of this proceeding, you know, we can put those in. But what I'd like to do is. Um, Edison had proposed that you know, essentially separate tracks, one that would look at legal issues uh, surrounding uh, community opt-out, and then the other track looking at cost and cost allocation issues. Um, and with respect to the legal issues of, you know, for community opt-out, you know, there was a proposed briefing schedule. You know, do parties feel that the community opt-out option can be addressed only by through through legal briefs, or um, based on what Mr. Tobin has said, you know, could workshops also be used uh, for that track, Mr. Tobin? Uh, all of my clients would oppose this on the California Edison proposal. Okay. Uh, on a couple of fundamental grounds, one is. The assumption that there is no factual determinations required with respect to this uh, is false. Uh, we have never intended that the community opt-out do what Southern California Edison characterizes as deprive an individual customer of a choice to have time of day pricing. We fully intend that the testimony will show that it is the wireless mesh network component of this that my clients object to on behalf of their communities and their organizations, and that we are confident we will be able to show that if a, a community opts out and several citizens in that community want to have time of day pricing, that there are feasible, uh, practical, available, mm -hmm. and economically, uh, you know, reasonable alternatives to what the utilities have elected in terms of this technology. Unless the utilities are prepared to stipulate to that, then I think hearings are absolutely necessary. My last comment is cost <coughs> and community opt-out and technology, these questions are all kind of circular in, or mutually dependent, I guess I would say. Because, for example, if opting out was free, very many people believe the opt-out participation rate, or whatever you call the percentage of customers that opt out, would be dramatically higher. Dramatically higher. Now we have no community where that's been tried yet. We have no scientific test of that done yet in the real world, but there are statisticians who can speak to that economic consequence. The opt-out rate now was reduced by the commission uh, with uh, little financial calculations that I've seen to a number lower than what the utilities wanted, which was a step in the right direction, perhaps. But the opt-out rate could be significantly higher if the pricing was significantly different. So until we know what the costs are, how can you evaluate what the participation rate, I don't think I'm using it the same way you've been, Mr. Wild was using that term, but what the effect would be of differing rates depends somewhat on the cost, not only to the utility, but to the customer. And so I really oppose the idea of saying that somehow you can decide the community opt-out feasibility and ration rationality of the programs being presented until you know what the costs are that you're dealing with. And my last point with respect to schedule and costs is just, I think, yesterday or the day before, uh, you issued a ruling having to do with how data in the DRA report concerning SCE would be treated as either confidential or public. Yes. And I think that it's well within the scope of this proceeding to say that once that's decided, whatever that is, the data that is being made public for SCE should be made available by PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric in comparable format so that we can all evaluate that. And to the extent that data remains confidential, then we're going to need some form of non-disclosure agreement slash protective order before we can actually uh, dig into these things and prepare testimony. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Marcel Haverger on behalf of TURN. Um, with respect to just the issue of the procedural schedule for determining a community opt-out choice, um, I have to say that two, two things. I do believe that this is an issue of policy that should not necessarily uh, would have to be informed by a question of costs. So I believe that there should be some requirement for either testimony or utility filing to address the question of whether there will be or would be incremental costs due to community um, opt-out. And I, I don't know if there would be or would not be, and I think some of that might be depend. I've been assuming a community opt-out is defined as a municipality, but I, I know Your Honor and other parties have raised the issue of defining a community as including some type of multifamily or, um, uh, or, or, or other uh, grouping, and that may raise different cost issues. Um, so that would be my one uh, issue. And the second issue that makes this particularly challenging is that um, there's an undecided cost allocation component uh, which makes it difficult to know in advance the level of, uh, for example, my interest. Uh, my interest in the uh, incremental costs um, will depend greatly on who's going to pay for them. So, you know, in an ideal world, I would recommend that uh, cost allocation issues be uh, determined up front, and that would um, make it uh, easier for parties to know um, to what extent to participate in the issue of uh, the costs and uh, determining an opt-out option for communities. Your Honor, I th I, are we on? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, uh, I know we will get to the procedural schedule on the cost and cost allocation issue probably next, but I do agree with Mr. Howager that, that the two issues are related, and pg position is that uh, we ought to move forward with the cost and cost allocation schedule on a, on a more expeditious uh, schedule than proposed by Southern California Edison. Uh, PG&E and, and SDG&E are prepared to provide updated uh, cost uh, information uh, by mid-July. Um, and also in response to Mr. Weil, who I think has uh, made a very good point about the need to uh, assess what rate making and rate design would be provided to deal with uh, uh, the variable costs in terms of participation. Again, PG&E is very confident that there are mechanisms that uh, the Commission can adopt and that can be used to assure that to the extent that costs vary based on participation, that those costs, either through balancing account treatment or through uh, uh, annual revision, uh, can be adapted to assure that uh, there's a true up, if you will, for actual participation. And PG&E would envision that its updated cost testimony would include proposals in that regard. And finally, in response to Mr. Howager's concern about allocation, again, we anticipate that our cost testimony, updated cost testimony, would deal with exactly those issues that uh, uh, Turn is concerned about in terms of cost recovery, uh, which particular customers will bear the actual costs and the actual revenue requirement. So our general uh, support is for moving forward uh, as expeditiously as possible with the procedural schedule on the cost and cost allocation issues, uh, we have no position on the schedule for the community opt-out. I'd like to say that um, our position is that um, apartment buildings and banks of uh, smart meters on a single building should be considered as a community issue. Um, and that in line with the arguments put forth by uh, the city of Fairfax, it's really an issue of democracy and the power of people to determine their own destiny. So that we think that uh, with respect to community and apartment buildings, that uh, the people involved in the decision to have smart meters are the ones who should determine whether there will be any. Uh, that means that, say, in an apartment building, that people will be called together into a council and they can discuss 
with full information and full transparency about the, uh, the technology, whether they as a community, as a, as a uh, unit, should adopt these smart meters.